Hello and welcome back to the She Gallery Show. Thank you for being with us today. We are with you live and we are live with East. East One, thank you for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is so awesome. So one of the one of the downfalls from COVID was that we were not able to have live guests here. And now post COVID, we find that we could have guests from all over the world joining us live. And we're extremely excited to have such a special guest with us today. And you remember that you can join us and um, throughout the conversation th throughout this live segment. And you can also visit our website at sharinghisenergygallery.net. Again, that's sharinghisenergygallery.net. And you can learn more about our upcoming exhibition, Evolution. And we are celebrating the family resemblance. And this is the first generation um, graffiti writers from Chicago that helped develop the Chicago style graffiti. And we have East One joining us. He's first generation um, from Hammond, Indiana. And you started writing in 1982. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about yourself, East? Uh, yeah, like you said, I came from uh, Hammond, Indiana. That's where I was born. Um, cut my teeth, though, basically in the shy itself when I was really young. Um, my parents separated and we moved to Evanston. And then from Evanston, we ended up moving down, um, you know, close to Rogers Park and then eventually settled in the West Loop area. So um, when it came to uh, graffiti writing, you know, writing the trains and everything uh, back in the late seventies to early eighties, I used to see all kinds of things on the line. Not all of it was uh, graffiti as we would know today, but you know, there were scrawlings all over like um, these abstract white paint designs and uh, all of these random uh, little stencils, including ants and clothespins and things like that all over the city. So um, it was stuff like that that kind of got me interested in, in doing public art. And then, you know, of course, as the eighties developed graffiti started to pop up on the, on the lines also. So, all of that uh, led into my influence. Awesome. But you actually started breakdancing before you got into graffiti. Is that right? You want to talk to us a little bit about, about your introduction to breakdancing and your influences? Yeah, like, um, you know, many kids back in the 70s and 80s, um, New York was a big influence. Um, I, I can't say exactly where I first saw breaking. Um, I do remember going to see it at uh, or in the movie theaters and the movie Flashdance. I want to say that was, gosh, was that was the late 70s or early 80s? Might have been 80, 81. But um, uh, exactly how I got into b-boying, I don't really remember. It's just been way too long. Uh, but ultimately, b-boying led into uh, interest for graffiti. Uh, a lot of the articles that I would try to find when I would go to the local library and stuff and try to find articles on breakdancers from New York, uh, there was always graffiti in the backdrop. So that's kind of uh, another influence that uh, got me started on the path of doing graffiti. Mm -hmm. And so then you come from Indiana, you come to Chicago, and you were already in a crew in Indiana, is that right? Is that Hitman? Or was well, ATT around before? No, Hitman was there first, uh, but I wasn't actually in Hitman until after I'd come into the Chicago. Um, I think we had talked before about Sheldon's Sheldon's art store where uh, Fusky Fess, who was one of my mentors, um, where he worked. So in around 1984, I was just walking around the city and my mother didn't live too far from there. And I happened upon Sheldon's due to the, all the uh, graffiti signage that was in the window. And that's where I met Fusky Fess. And through Fusky Fess, I met a lot of other writers, uh, you know, Cato. Uh, the first time I ever saw Trickster, he came into the shop. Um, you know, various other people would constantly come by. but uh, when the hitman came into um, into the city, I think it was around 1985 or six, I was hanging out at Sheldon's and they came in and I asked Fesky who they were and he explained that they were out of uh, the harbor, out of East Chicago. And I said, oh, you know, that's not too far from where my family lives. I bounced back and forth between my mom's in Chicago and my dad's uh, over in Indiana. So I, you know, made it a point to try and find some of their uh, pieces and, in, in, uh, Hammond and East Chicago area and eventually hooked up with them. And then, uh, you know, Rooster and I painted a wall in Crown Point, Indiana in 86 is when we started the fall of 86. 
and then uh, actually didn't even get to finish it until the spring of 87. But uh, it was during that painting that I actually joined the Hitmen. So I was crewless up until about 86 when I joined the Hitmen. Crewless up until 86. So, and then you joined many, many, many crews later after that, and we'll get to that. But you mentioned Rooster, we mentioned some cool history. So we want to share our screen here now. And, oh, I believe this is the one. So we want to share our screen now so that you can take a look at some of these images that, um, <laughs> that, that we're talking about here now. We have, did you send me the one? Oh, no, we didn't. Okay, but here we are. We have a small sketch here from Hitman, and this is in 1986. So everybody always talks about being paper kings before they go on to walls. So you want to talk to us a little bit about your um, your face of sketches of becoming, um, of going from a sketch paper king to to a king of the walls and of, of trains and, and throughout the, the, the movement from graffiti and, um, and b-boy. You want to talk to us a little bit about this area in your graffiti career yeah uh, looking at that sketch i can tell i was uh it was a strong mix between what i was seeing in you know new york and then also what i was seeing uh locally through fesky fast and, and some of the other influences um rooster as well um that is actually the the kind of style that i did on my first rooftop along the douglas b line it was something very similar to that um I was pretty much just scribbling a lot under in underpasses and you know in place that I could find even my old man was letting me paint on the garage it wasn't until uh, 86 when Husky took me to do my first rooftop that I actually you know put paint to to real brick on the line in some kind of substantial manner um, he took me to a rooftop that he had off the Douglas B and beforehand, we went to his place, we sorted through his paint, and he said, you know, if I'm going to be using his paint, I also need to do his name. So instead of taking up the whole space to do an East piece, I ended up doing an ESFS uh, that stood for East and Fess. So that's about, the, that's about the same style I was probably doing from 86 to um, close to 87. Nice. And here we have um, an, another early image of another piece that you did here with uh, with Trickster, and this is in 89. And uh, many of you guests are already familiar with Trickster. And this, this I, I just love this story. Can you please talk to us a little bit about um, the Rainbow Club and what went on in the Rainbow Club? I know that Pango and many of our, our previous guests have talked about the Rainbow Club. What was your experience like in the Rainbow, um, the Rainbow Club and how did that introduce you to Trickster and Slang and Warp and many other writers here in Chicago and uh, led you to join their crew such as TAC and Feds? Yeah, so um, apparently the Feds and the crew that I had just joined, Hitman, had some kind of animosity, some kind of beef. and. Eventually, I found out why there was a photo circulating around of Ohms and Rooster and maybe maybe Trask. I can't remember who else, but of them urinating on one of their pieces. <laughs> so uh, a battle was supposed to take place and I would go to the rainbow to um, basically to hear, you know, DJ battles, mixes from DJs and, and the B-boy. Uh, I didn't really roller skate, which is what the rainbow actually was. It was more of a roller rink. Um, I was there during uh, one of the events and heard that the feds were in the house. So we ended up meeting up with uh, all three of them, Trickster, or uh, Orko, and Slang. Uh, Trickster kind of didn't give me the time of day and he just walked off and went into the B-boy ciphers and Orko did what Orko does best, um, talked a lot and uh, told us how we were never going to be able to compete with the feds. But, uh, you know, Slang stuck around and, and he was willing to, look at the sketches and everything like that he kind of took it serious so at, at that point you know he just kind of wished us luck and said you know i guess we'll see you you know on the line and uh, i ran into trickster again at another point where he was riding the lines i met him at uh i want to say it was belmont i think it was the belmont station um he was driving or riding around with a copy of the subway art and they had just finished or not so sorry, our spray can art, which he was in, and they had just finished the Return of the King's Wall. So I saw him on the station, and he said, well, if you really want to battle, ride the, uh, you know, the line, it was the uh, Howard line, the red, over to Wilson and see our latest wall, which is the Return of the Kings. 
so I did that. And of course, you know, like anybody, that wall was incredibly impressive that, you know, I don't think anybody was doing anything quite that LinkedIn and, and with that much production value at that time, he and Orco were really a force when it came to doing production value stuff. Um, but, you know, I stuck to my guns. I said, yeah, I can, I can beat that. So uh, somehow, you know, Trickster and I got each other's numbers. We started talking and eventually he came to my house and just through sitting and talking about graffiti and styles and sketching together, we realized that we had some common threads and, you know, before we knew it, we were becoming fast friends and, the battle didn't seem to be as important anymore. It didn't really take place. So he and I would uh, go to each other's house all the time and hang out and sketch and just talk about the philosophy of lettering and, and our styles. And he was, uh, you know, he was very mathematical and he had a philosophy all of his own on how letter structures should be done. And it's basically that, um, you know, that kind of method and that uh, philosophy that was the backbone for what became Chicago's graffiti. A philosophy, a backbone, and we're talking about abstracting the type typography. Can you talk to us about abstracting the typography? We're talking about kids and a crew ATT, and they're abstracting typography, as he's mentioning. There's a formula, there's a math, there's a serious skill and serious mind, like serious minds, like serious thinking that is, that, that is being like formed for this. It's not just like going out there and see what's being like, what's cool. There's an actual formula to this. And then later you join their crew. Um, something very interesting when I was talking to you and I said, you know, you, you never stopped doing graffiti. Like what, why did you never stop? You know, many people stop for some reason. Like you mentioned, some people may think like, oh, it's just something that you face yourself out of. And that is for some people, but for you, you said, I am graffiti. You said graffiti is not something that I do. Graffiti is something that I am. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what that means for you? Yeah, just me personally. And it's not something that I feel, um, you know, should be forced on anyone else. You know, everyone's got their own reasons for doing it and their own philosophies. And some people move on, some people continue. Uh, I just never made a separation. I never made a separation of graffiti was just going to be something that I would do for a while. And then as I became an adult, I would, you know, quote unquote, do adulting and that graffiti would go to the wayside. Whatever I decided I was going to do in life, graffiti would always still be there and still be present. And, uh, you know, there were hurdles, I have to say, you know, doing graffiti as a grown man and especially at, at my age, uh, there are hurdles in certain, you know, views that people take uh, when they hear that. But uh, for me personally, it's just a part of me. It's, it helped uh, helped bring me through my youth. It helped bring me through a lot of hard times. Um, it always gave me something positive to do and it gave me positive reinforcement. And it basically became a part of me. So I just never felt like I needed to separate graffiti from myself and I never felt the need to stop doing it. Um, and I still really enjoy it. I really enjoy it a lot. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I do paint legal, but, uh, illegal is still, you know, the majority of what I like to paint. And it's, it's where I find myself enjoying it the most. I may not be doing as high a profile spots as maybe I would have when I was younger, uh, but just being out in that, uh, in that moment, doing something that's a little more risky, something that I shouldn't do or being out at night. Um, it, it's just a feeling or a mood that you just can't duplicate. Thank you so much for that. It's such a great honor. And, you know, we're talking about something that, you know, you're saying like you just you just love it. It just makes you feel good. It's such a therapeutic way of, of being. It's a way of life and it's freedom. It truly is. Um, so aside from the unity that hip hop brings and this creative, amazing force that follows, um, we also have this opportunity of, of being a part of, of different groups, right? So we're talking about crews. For those of you who are not familiar with crews and the way that, that graffiti crews work, and you might want to compare it to a gang life, for example, as many people do. Um, you know, I know that we've talked a lot about how graffiti has saved people from joining gangs because growing up in the hood, you don't have an option between becoming folks or people so you sometimes find an outlet and then you go to graffiti and everybody seems to leave you alone and it's really interesting and, and i want to talk to you a little bit about that too we'll go back to the stars and the crowns um 
with the fame and the crowns uh there's six point stars five point stars and then we have crowns six point crowns five point crowns and three point crowns and it is the graffiti writer that takes the three point crown and that's what differentiates um those 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 points but something else is when you're playing with fonts and we're going to go back to screen share and oh wrong one sorry this is the first time that we do this so thank you for your patience everybody um we're talking about the evolution of chicago style graffiti right so we're talking about this development and we're talking about playing with letters so you know the the announcement that we had that I'm sorry that I don't have up here it reads you as aste and then you write east and then sometimes we see esto and then for pengo sometimes we see pg and sometimes we see mikey and for trickster sometimes we see tricks sometimes we see roan so you're still playing with different letters right um what wh why do you guys do that what's what's your take on this for the development it's to keep yourself from being rutted and for doing and from doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, after a while, you know, for myself, I've been painting almost 40 years now and doing the same letters and the same pattern over and over again becomes repetitious. So you find, you know, other ways to break out of that. You rearrange the letters in your original name uh, to create a, a new flow so that you're structuring the letters differently. Or in this case, you know, you're showing an Aste piece right now. Aste is just simply East and Italian. So you default to maybe other languages. I've done Oster pieces, which is a, um, you know, East. It, it's not a direct um, translation in German, but it has um, its roots. Oster has its roots in East uh, in the language German. And then Este is simply Spanish. So you find these different uh, ways to kind of entertain yourself and break up the, the letter flow so that you're not constantly doing the exact same thing, but still trying to stay true to the roots. Um, also, sometimes you'll come up with a completely different name with completely different letters because you just want to try something new or try something different. So it's just a way of keeping yourself interested and keeping yourself entertained and at the same time not doing what we call running a style. Um, you know, doing the exact same letters with the exact same style and the exact same connections over and over and over again. It's called running a style. And there is, there are places and a point to that um, where it becomes almost like a, your own personal logo and it becomes quickly recognizable. And a lot of train riders and a lot of bombers like to run styles. And, you know, just recently I started to run a style, but overall you want to try and do something different and try to break it up and show that you have the technicality and the skill to go above and beyond just the four or the five letters that you've locked in to for your name. What makes Chicago style, Chicago style, the movement, the colors, what is it? We see so much color here. We see so much movement. What differentiates the Chicago style from other cities? So I think it can be translated by each individual, but the bones of it to me, and what I took from it was a, you know, a lower stretched out style, long bars. Um, there has to be, you know, some kind of, um, it doesn't have to be, it, it, from the beginning to the end, it doesn't have to be completely symmetrical, but there has to be some symmetry to the beginning of the piece and at the end of the piece that helps. Uh, it, it helps create a beginning and create an ending and helps draw you in and then lead you back out of the piece. And you know, ultimately falling back into the philosophy of, of you know, the formula that Trickster um, kind of based his pieces off of, excuse me. It's okay. And, and that I, you know, I also read into and, and, it, and it spoke to me was having a certain structure or flow. Letters are all built in stages, one stage, two stage, and three stage letters. And if one letter that you put in is missing a certain stage, you have to fill that stage with another letter. So say that there's a one stage letter next to it. You don't want to put another one stage letter next to it. You want to put a two stage or a three stage letter to it. And you start to create this pattern. Um, think of like uh, an ebb and a flow, like the infinity, the infinity logo. You know, it looks like a number eight on its side or the uh, helix to a DNA, the way it ebbs and it flows. I feel like graffiti should have that same ebb and flow. It's, it's just 
natural and your eye becomes more entertained by it if it has the right ebb and the right flow. Mm -hmm. And to me, graffiti from Chicago has that ebb and that flow. And then as far as coloring, we, we do a lot of um, highlighting, high contrast, and what I call machine gun glaring, a lot of white. And uh, a lot of that came off of seeing pieces on the line. And when you go by quickly, you use that high impact coloring, those high contrast colors and all that highlighting to catch your eye immediately. Mm -hmm. And so, so and it does. And it does. And I just want to I just want to show the audience really quick here, because I think that sometimes people look at it and they see, oh, that's pretty. I don't know what it says, but it's pretty. And this is what I hear people saying. But I just want to show if you guys can see. Can you guys see my, my mouse? Well, I don't know if you could see the mouse, but you can see and the E, the E on the left side of the screen, and then the A, and then the S, and then the T. I don't know if you can tell, but it's carried on. It's kind of carried by an arrow. And this arrow is kind of moving throughout the entire piece. So I know we've talked about this before. Some of these, these hints of old style graffiti has those little bubble letters, has that shine, has that glow, and has those arrows. And that represents movement, which is a lot of what this is. So I know we talked about hip yeah. hop, how um, DJing, break dancing, MC, and all that makes you move, but this is how graffiti moves as well. This yeah, and I, 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 and I want to speak a moment on that long barred arrow that you see there at the yes. top, and it kind of leads to the whole piece. That is, you know, that is what I've coined the Chicago long bar, and that is just one of the things that I took from seeing, you know, pivotal pieces in Chicago, um, like the Midwest Masters and the way Roan and those guys structured their letters. They always had those kind of connections that helped carry you through, and that was uh, pivotal pivotal um, component to me of Chicago style is that Chicago longboard. That's, 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 that's dope. And that's the kind of thing that we need to know. You know, this is why we're having this show. It's not just pretty colors. Yes, it's cool, but there's so much significance behind it. So let's talk a little bit more about some more of your, your pieces. What do we have here? Yeah, this is an illegal tunnel piece I did, uh, Easto. And I wanted to just do really subtle colors so that there was a kind of a glowing contrast between the outline and the, uh, and the fill in. So I kept it black. I did a medium tone instead of a really bright tone outline and then highlighted the 3D with, with a darker tone and a lighter tone. And I felt like the, uh, you know, again, lighting and contrast and things like that is to me pivotal in Chicago's style. Um, we tend to, like I said, do a lot of highlighting and things like that. And sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's really in your face. Mm -hmm. But all of that um, kind of buys into the whole Chicago formula that, you know, I at least um, equate Chicago graffiti with. And I know that there, I'm sure there are other cities that have similar methods. Um, but right now, you know, we're not talking about other cities. We're talking about Chicago. And these are the things that uh, that I read into and that influenced me and that I've tried to bring it out in my work consistently through the uh you know the last 40 years oh, this is beautiful it's like it's like speed it's like cursive and it just draws you yeah. and here we have this this long bar here too right the arrow yeah yep there are a couple of long bars there and you know and you said uh you said something about fonts or typography and you know all of those played in uh, really big in chicago's history too fesky fest was very huge on using fonts and so was Trickster. And Trickster and I had both had a love for calligraphy. And we used to do a lot of drawings together that we call, you know, we coined calligraphy. And that played a huge influence on, you know, the way that we structured our letters. Um, so, you know, there's, there's things called kerning. Kerning is another way of, of filling those voids. It's very much another way we use those, you know, as I said that the letters were in stages, one stage, two stage, and three stage. You can also, um, that was just our way of interpreting kerning. Kerning is a typography and calligraphy term that helps make letters look natural and helps them flow and, and fills in the negative spaces between the letters. Um, and that was important to make letters and words look correctly in calligraphy and in typography. And we bring that, or we at least try to bring that into our graffiti as well. 
And here we have, um, we have an East 93 CTA battle. I know we only have a few minutes left, but can you, can you briefly talk to us about this, uh, the CTA battle? Yeah, I mean, we all participated, I think, at some point, you know, it, in that generation or those, those first two generations in the CTA battles. Um, we thought, you know, we thought it was kind of, uh, cool that they were allowing us to paint on legal walls all over the city. But we also knew that it was a way for the graffiti squad to come around, get pictures of us and equate us to our tags and our pieces. Um, so I tried to camouflage as mine as much as possible and uh, threw a lot of colors into it. Um, a lot of different shading techniques. And I see a lot of techniques that were popular in the nineties that maybe I wouldn't do now. I even threw wood grain fill-ins into that thing. So I kind of went buck nuts on that. But um, and also, you know, graffiti magazines were kind of big in the early 90s. And then I was finding out that there were other Easts that started after me in other cities and in other countries. So that was uh, that was a piece that I kind of addressed that and, and kind of semi-dedicated that to, oh, that was last night. <laughs> um, I, I kind of addressed that and, and dedicated that to these other writers, letting them know like, hey, I came first. So I, I, I've got the name, so I keep the fame. Now, I came first. Is that where uh, the Alpha Kid comes from? What's the Alpha Child all about? So the Alpha Child was after I moved out of the Shy and I moved to Kansas City. Um, I was still TAC, but I was by myself now. I didn't have any crewmates. So suddenly I was solo. So in order to still write TAC, but to be a solo artist or a solo writer, I started writing the Alpha Child. Meaning I was TAC, but I was out by myself. I was no longer in the shy. Out by yourself, no longer in the shy. Oops, sorry, I gotta do stop share. And this is again new, so thank you for your patience. And I know time goes by so, 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 so fast. So East, East One is um, again from, from Northwest Indiana, and then he comes to Chicago. And then he represents ATT, TAC, Seesaw, Feds, TDT, TDTE, so many crews. And um, I know there's some crews that, like, back before, it was like, if you were in one crew, you couldn't be in another crew. And that's where I was going with comparing with, with gangs. Gangs, I think, are trying to make a life, like, because society has pushed you out so much that you know that society is not welcoming, so you know that you don't have a chance at the education system, at employment, and blah, blah, blah. So then you do what you got to do to do what you got to do, right? To feed your kids. So what a lot of gangs do is um, they set up, you know, these neighborhoods, and then they sell drugs, and then they have guns. And all of this is to make money and then, like, to gain this respect because society has kind of washed them away. Um, very different than what graffiti writers do. Graffiti writers are looking for an outlet and beautify the city, not taking money, actually spending their own money or using their own artwork, which cost so much money back in the day. You know, people would just take it because kids were just kids, right? With no money. Um, but like now that we're working with these with these graffiti writers from first generation and it's applied to everything that you do with organization skills, right? with talking, with just contributing, just being a member of something helps you gain social skills to some extent with organizing, being part of a crew, and all of that is very fruitful for, for our future. So, um, you know, tons of respect for these graffiti writers, first generation, that are still doing it through date. We are extremely excited to have you join us um, at Family Resemblance. It's such an honor, and we look forward to hearing more from our other guests and understanding why it's so important to recognize and honor this art form for what it has grown into for its movement and for what it represents. Do you have anything else that you would like to leave the audience with for the last minute? Uh, I do. I just want to say that, you know, without uh, the support and the development that I got uh, by hanging out with my mentors um, in order would be, you know, my most crucial mentors would have been Fesky Fest. Uh, Rooster from the Hitman, and of course, uh, my good friend Ty, uh, Trickster Roan. So uh, without those three, there would not be the East that developed the way he did today. So I uh, just want to give my love and my props and a lot of credit to those three guys for helping me out so much and 
you know, no matter where I'm at, I'm always going to be representing the, mid the Midwest and the shy. So thanks for having me on. Thank you. And really, really quick, I hope I don't get in trouble, but that was something else that I thought was really beautiful, that this roster, I didn't realize that some of these guys had never even met each other. So that's even makes it this, this exhibition even that much more special, that we're truly tying in these, um, these members and bringing them all together from all around. So thank you guys so much for presenting the Chicago. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.